By the end of this video module, you will be able to explain how essential standards fit within the core curriculum, define the comparative relationship between essential and priority standards, and describe how priority standards shape the recording and reporting process and how proficiency skills support it. At the end of the 2019-2020 school year, each department came together as a team to identify the non-negotiable or essential standards of each grade, course, and content. These original documents can be found on the curriculum website, on the Teacher Leadership tab, under the Department and Grade Level Chairs section. You will see a button labeled Original Folder of Identified Essential Standards that you can click. That button will take you to the original folder of documents that were submitted. The fundamental assumptions surrounding the selection of the essential standards is the knowledge that all students don't learn the same way or at the same speed. Some students lack academic behaviors and some students lack prior skills and knowledge. Gaps in learning didn't occur because of the pandemic. They've always been there. The emergency learning in the spring of 2020 only amplified the need to ensure that the gaps are addressed systematically and with equity. What we noticed is that the pandemic magnified the need to identify the standards that are most essential. These carefully selected standards are the ones that are guaranteed that all students will know and be able to demonstrate mastery of at the end of the school year in order to be prepared to enter the next grade level or course. For students who haven't mastered the essential standards of a greater course, extra time and support are provided and extension options for those who have already mastered them. They don't represent all you're going to teach. They're just the minimum that a student must learn to reach the highest levels of learning as they progress through to the next grade or course. Let's listen in to PLC expert Mike Matos explain how essential standards are the basis for all of our curricular documents and pedagogical decisions. Marzano did a study of our national standards. Here's what he found. To cover them all, we'd have to go from a K-12 program to a K-22 program. Unless one of the interventions in your district is kids get to go to school until they're 27, they're not going to learn them all. So what's been the unintended outcome of asking teachers since no child left behind past to cover all your state standards and yet once they get to their room they know it's impossible? Well teachers can't announce, I'm skipping some. So in the privacy of their own room, when the standards police aren't watching, teachers are making choices. They, stand, they think this way, I think this is really important, I'm going to hit this hard, in fact I might even find time to reteach it. If kids don't get it. This is pretty important. I'll make sure I teach it. All kids will have exposure to it, but I might not even find time to reteach if kids don't get it. And I'll try to get to everything, but if I run out of time, I might not get to this stuff. But the problem is every teacher is forced to do it in the privacy of their own room. So what's been the unintended outcome? Three national studies of the actual curriculum. Not what's on your state guide or your district guide, what's actually being taught. Here are the words to describe it a self-selected jumble of standards. Wild variation, school to school, teacher to teacher, on what a child might learn, same course, same grade level, same subject. And the actual language arts curriculum is called curricular chaos. We must take this process out into the light of day. Why? We agreed one teacher can't meet the needs of every child. So we're going to work collectively to meet the needs of every child. But how can we share kids and respond collectively if we're all teaching different things at different times? We can't. Robert Marzano, an instructional strategy researcher, explains that the content that teachers are expected to address constitutes the guaranteed curriculum. That specific content must be adequately covered in the instructional time teachers have available in order to be considered viable. And according to PLC expert Richard Dufour, in collaborative research with Marzano, the only way curriculum in school can truly be guaranteed is if the teachers who are called upon to deliver the curriculum have worked collaboratively to collectively study the standards using internal and external resources, agreed on the priorities within the curriculum, 
clarified how the curriculum translate into student knowledge and skills, established what proficiency is for each standard, created general pacing guidelines for delivering the curriculum, and committed to one another that they will in fact teach the agreed upon curriculum. As Dr. King always says, the written curriculum is the taught curriculum and is the assessed curriculum. This is truly the only way to ensure a guaranteed and viable curriculum for our students. Hello everyone. I want to take just a moment to talk about meshing last quarter's experience with our essential learning standards. In our district, we have essential learning standards at every grade level. These are standards that absolutely we feel must be taught and mastered by the student in order to be successful in the next grade and further on in school and in their life. Last quarter, there were many students who were not able to, for whatever reason, master many of their essential standards that they would have mastered during fourth quarter of that school year. So when we come into this year, our first instinct is to go back and to reteach those standards and to make sure the students are caught up before beginning what would be this school year. However, we don't have any time to delay and we have no time to take large chunks of time to reteach last year's standards. So in my mind, this is like a plate and string theory. If you have a student who is in the fourth grade and they are behind in their multiplication, uh, you, you can't take all of their third grade learning and teach all of third grade to get them back up to where they need to be for multiplication. But what you can do is look back at that, those third grade standards and take the pieces that they need to build it up to fourth grade multiplication. And so it's more like instead of lifting an entire plate, which is way too heavy and takes way too long, we just pull up a nice little string up to the standard that we need to get the student from where they were to where they need to be. And this, this string is what we need to look at as we go through our school year. So we're going to start the year on our normal standards. And then as we come to an essential standard that last year may have been missed, we can think about that in advance and we can build that string of all that scaffolding that we need to get to the point where we need the students to be. So instead of taking large chunks of time to, to reteach big units, Instead, we're pulling up the pieces that we need as we go through the year, and we're hitting those standards that we know that they missed in the past. And this whole purpose of doing that is so that we can continue to get them to move forward in the year that we're in, while still scaffolding their learning from what they may have been missed in the years past. Essential standards and priority standards have much in common in their definition, as they should. Some of the essential standards are priority standards that were already identified for your grade level or course. They have some technical differences as well, though. Priority standards are the standards that have proficiency scales with common formative assessments. They are the standards worthy of reporting student progress as determined by our extensive review of the performance level descriptors provided by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. The priority standards are selected based on the work of Larry Ainsworth from his research on rigorous curriculum design. We might report on a priority standard that is not deemed essential because we have found it to have relevance to the community or it has special implications for high stakes assessments. Neither of these reasons would cause a standard to be automatically viewed as essential, however. Essential standards are what we would consider our non-negotiable standards that are vital to the successful progression of learning for students. Essential standards are what teachers will spend the majority of instructional time teaching, what data-driven discussions will center upon, and what interventions are focused around, through enrichment or remediation. In other words, essential standards are the standards that we will not allow students to leave our grade or course without reaching proficiency. And the priority standards are all of the standards identified in a course or grade level as worthy of reporting. For convenience, we have created a kindergarten through 12th grade vertical alignment of all the essential and priority standards for ELA and math. The priority standards are identified with blue ink and the essential standards are identified with a very thick font. As you peruse it, you might notice that some of the essential standards are not priority standards. 
That is because priority standards are the standards we report student progress, and essential standards are the standards we ensure all of our students have met proficiency in before moving them on to the next grade or course. This document can be found on the Grandview C4 curriculum website by going to the Professional Development tab, going about halfway down the page, and you'll see a big blue button that says K-12 Essential and Priority Standards Vertical Alignment for ELA and Math. At this point, you may be wondering, how do I know what level of proficiency each of my students are at in regards to the reported standards? The answer is found by using proficiency scales. Those are a collection of learning targets or goals combined into a progression of learning. The learning goals are organized into a scale where each priority standard has been decomposed based upon the item specification and performance level descriptor documents issued from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for every grade and course. Listen now as Mike Meadows explains how the essential and priority standards are used to create clarity in the teaching and learning our students need. It's not when you go back, you'll sit down with your teammates, you'll take out the state standards for your course or grade level or elementary, you'll start with a subject, and then read them off one at a time and say, is this essential? And if you all agree, you highlight it. When you're all done, you have a highlighted list and you say, we're done, check. That's what our school did the first time, because we didn't know better. We had problems almost instantly. Why? Teachers, would you agree with this? Sometimes the way state standards are written could be confusing enough to interpretation. Right? The educational East they're written in, we hit that. A team would read off a standard, assume that they all defined it the same way. They didn't. They all called it essential. They went back to their room and taught it to their interpretation. Then it came time to write a common assessment, PLC question two, how do we know if kids have learned it? And they couldn't agree upon the test questions. Why? Because they honestly never agreed upon what the standard meant in the first place. So looking at that chart, see that first left-hand column? It says standard description. What our school does is when a team identifies an essential standard, the first thing they do is they rewrite the standard in their own words. They put it in simple, understandable words to make sure everyone on the team is laser-like clear on what it means. And they do it for them to guide their teamwork. But if it was in simple, understandable words, who could you share it with? The kids and the parents. If people trained in the field can't interpret what the state wrote, what makes you think a kid is going to? But you can't stop there. Take a look at the next column over. Example rigor. You can agree upon the standard. You also have to agree upon what will it look like if a child's proficient. Get this. If I had the California language arts standards with me right now, read to you fourth grade persuasive writing, read the standard. Senior year high school, read the standard. Guess what? Word for word the same. What you expect from a senior is going to be different than a fourth grader in persuasive writing, right? So what a team does, they say, okay, here's what the standard means. Now, next column, example rigor. What will it look like if a child's proficient? For a math standard, they might put a sample math problem in there. Sometimes it won't fit in that box. The team will attach a rubric. Here's the rubric we're going to grade this persuasive essay by. It could be a student anchor paper. Here's what we think a three is on our district four-point rubric for persuasive writing. And the team does it for them to guide their teaching and their assessment. But who else could you share it with? The kids before you teach the unit. Rick Stiggins says any kid can hit any learning target. Step one, show them the target. Let them see what you want of them. At the beginning of the unit, they're more likely to hit it at the end. You can't stop there. Next column over. Prerequisite skills. This will change your interventions forever. This is what prior skills and knowledge do you need to learn the new skill? Why is that so important? Because the best intervention is prevention. The best intervention is prevention. The best intervention is giving kids help before they fail. Might give us an example. Sure. Third grade, California. New math skill we start the year with is multiplication. To learn how to multiply, you must know how to what? Add. You can start the school year by teaching multiplication to every third grader. Find out some kids have failed it at the end of the unit. Figure out that the reason why a kid can't multiply is because they can't add. Then go back and teach addition to that kid then multiplication again, or you could do what? Screen kids for the critical skill of addition before you start to teach the unit on multiplication. 
Why? Because if a kid can't add, you know they're going to struggle with multiplication. You can be proactive. The way my dear colleague and co-author Chris Weber says it is this. If it is predictable, it is preventable. The other thing about that column is if the Algebra 1 team identifies the essential standards for the first semester and the prior skills needed, who could they share that column with? The pre-algebra team to see if what they chose is essential matched what the algebra team thinks kids have to walk in with. Then it starts a vertical articulation conversation. Any of you, any of you here struggle with English language learners? I got a tip for you. Ready? We found in California, in the school that I was principal at, we found our EL kids did better when they knew what we were saying. I know it's stunning. Hard to believe. It's true. Now, I jest, but I don't. You want to know what else goes in that column of prerequisite skills? Academic vocabulary need to learn the concepts. Why? You front load the vocabulary. Why? Those kids can learn it if they knew what you were saying. So you make sure they know the key words. Prerequisite skills. Next column over, when taught. We're not talking to rigid pacing guys. But a team can agree upon an essential standard, but if one teacher wants to teach in October and the other teacher wants to teach it in January, how do you share kids for interventions? You must teach the essentials about the same time. Next column over, common assessment. If it's important enough for every kid to learn it, we're going to assess the same way, and we're going to determine it before we teach the unit. So we're all clear what the target is by the end. Then finally, last column, extension skills. I'm often asked, what do you do with kids for intervention? What do you do with the kids who've already learned it when you got to reteach it to the kids who didn't get it? Great question. Plan ahead. Would you agree in your curriculum, teachers, there are things that kids have got to know and things that are nice to know? Yes? We're trying to identify the got to know things here, the things you must learn. But there are other things that you teach that it won't kill a kid next year if they don't get it this year. It won't set them up to fail next year. Well, let's identify what those things are in each unit. Why? If you identify what those things are, when it's time to reteach kids who didn't get the essential, you'll know what you're going to teach the kids who, who, who've already gotten it, and it's meaningful work for them. Look at that chart for a second, teachers. Can you imagine if next fall you had that level of clarity on what you wanted kids to learn? In order to create a proficiency scale for a priority standard, the team first defines the topic of the proficiency scale and then determines the language of what it means to meet that standard. This proficiency statement is called the learning goal. Let's listen to Kendra Watson, our curriculum consultant with the Regional Professional Development Center, describe how proficiency scales are organized. So the first thing I want you to think about is, um, what is a proficiency scale? And it's a collection of learning targets or goals organized into a progression of learning. And so you can think of um, a student climbing up the stairs. You know, they're here at level one. They're moving to the next level. They're moving to the next level. And you're um, teaching them at the level that they are at. Uh, and then they can track and monitor where am I at in my learning. So proficiency scales is all about knowing where you're at in your learning. So um, the scales that you have decided to generate are in four different levels. So meeting, <clears throat> this is the expectation, the standard itself, as stated um, in our Missouri Learning Expectations. This is the goal where we want all students to be by the end of the year at meeting. Um, we talk about approaching, and approaching is the simpler learning goal, the foundational knowledge that is needed in order to get to meeting. And this is also where we just decided those not are those essential standards that need to be revisited from the grade before. They would be in this level of your standard if it's a foundational skill on one of your priority standards. Emerging. This is a student that hasn't demonstrated um, proficiency yet, and they are at a level where they need assistance um, in order to be successful. So anytime a student is not able to work independently, um, they need help in order to uh, solve the problem, in order to uh, work out, to think about uh, the learning, they would be at emerging. And last but not least up here, it is 
seating, and this is the level um, that is a more complex learning goal. It's above the learning target. It is a student who has mastered the, the essential uh, standards that you have identified, and we need to push them above and beyond. And we may comment earlier that really having that exceeding is really to keep pushing those students forward so we don't have students that are at meetings stay stagnant. You know, what can they do to show that they're moving above and beyond? As Mattis explained in an earlier video clip, once the team decides what meeting a standard means, they next determine the academic and domain-specific vocabulary that is related to the learning goal. This is recorded in the approaching section. The prerequisite knowledge and skills that are needed to meet the standard are also recorded in the approaching section. The essential standards from the preceding grade level or course are also included in the approaching section of the proficiency scale. Finally, determining how a student demonstrates exceeding the performance standard is listed in the exceeding section of the proficiency scale. The proficiency scales for kindergarten through 12th grade ELA and math can be found on the assessment tab of the curriculum website on a blue button that reads K-12 math and ELA priority standards and proficiency scales. These proficiency scales are how we discuss and report student progress with all stakeholders. The proficiency scales are also embedded in the curriculum map for each grade level and course to which they have already been written. We will dive into curriculum documents more deeply at another time. As proficiency scales are developed for each priority standard, they are then reported back to the teaching team for that grade level or course. Curriculum teams will use a protocol for sharing and tuning the proficiency scales, ensuring that all stakeholders fully understand and are in agreement with what it means to meet, approach, or exceed proficiency in any of the priority standards. The major takeaways from this module were, essential standards are not taught in advance of or in replacement of current grade or course content. They are non-negotiable standards identified in the learning progression with scaffolding lessons placed in the correct units of study for a few scaffolded lessons at just the right moment in time to ensure gaps are closed or previous learning is reinforced before accessing new learning in the current grade level or course. Progress is reported on the priority standards and Proficiency scales provide clarity around what it means to be approaching, meeting, or exceeding the learning goals, allowing for more accurate evidence collection and feedback that is truly meaningful for student growth.